When you think of shoot 'em up games, one typically thinks of a sci-fi game in space like Galaga or Gradius. I typically think of Toho, but I'm aware that's a me thing. But on that note, yeah, shmups can really be whatever you want them to be. A spaceship, a witch, a shrine maiden. The point is that shmups can be weirder than anything you can possibly imagine, and for some reason it still works. That brings us to today's topic. Twinbee! What, you thought I was only going to talk about Sega IPs on this show? Well, I guess Twinbee does look kind of like Opa Opa, but this game actually predates Fantasy Zone, so... Twinbee was made by Konami and released for arcades in 1985 with a Famicom port following in 1986. Alongside Sega's Fantasy Zone, it can be considered one of the pioneers of the cute em up subgenre. It centers on these anthropomorphic spaceships named Twinbee, Winby, and Gwinby. It proved pretty popular overall in Japan. Outside Japan, however, not so much. Europe got a few games here and there, but North America was not so lucky. These days, though, you can play the original games through Nintendo Switch Online, regardless of your region, so let's take a look at it now! In the year 2801, the evil King Spice has come from outer space to invade the peaceful Donburi Island, because when you're an evil alien ruler who wants to take over the world, the tiny island with a smiley face carved into it is clearly the best place to start. Anyway, a scientist named Dr. Cinnamon builds two spaceships to stop him, piloted by the Doctor's two sons, Anamon and Donamon. Ugh, I get the feeling it's a really bad pun that doesn't translate well behind those names. Twinbee can do two things, shoot and drop bombs to take out grounded threats. If you shoot at the clouds, a bell will pop out. Normally collecting the bell will just net you some points, but if you shoot it enough times it can turn blue, increasing your speed, white giving you a double shot, or flashing red which creates an after image for extra firepower. Thing is, the enemies in this game can be pretty relentless, and unless you get the speed power up, Twinbee moves frustratingly slowly. This makes grabbing the power-ups in the first place absurdly hard as early as the first level. Also, these enemies are downright bizarre. As soon as you start the game, you get bombarded by flying strawberries and spinning turnips. God, you know you fucked up if you managed to piss produce off. You ever see a strawberry attack someone before? Exactly. It ain't normal. But that's not all, because we also have forks shooting at you, kitchen knives jumping all over the place, and toilet seats clearly sick of being shat into. This game is fucking weird! Now, like most shmups, getting hit once usually means death, but sometimes if the shot only grazes you, you won't die, but you will lose your arms, which prevents you from using the bomb attack. When that happens, a first aid kit will arrive that you can grab to restore your arms. Usually. There were several times that I lost my arms and the first aid kit never showed up. It's really annoying, honestly. Well, there aren't any more enemies around, so I can safely keep shooting this bell to get the double shot. Or at least I'd like to, but it's not changing colors. Whoa, what the fuck? What the hell was that thing? Well, seeing as it's dead, I guess we'll never know. Okay, looks like it's boss time. A green ship with orbs surrounding it. It's not really all that hard. In fact, every boss in this game goes down really fast if you have the right equipment, but I'm having a hard time telling if I'm actually hitting it, because I can't tell if the orbs are meant to act like a shield or not, and the sound effect when you hit it doesn't exactly create the impression that I'm actually attacking it. Alright, time for level 2, though it's kind of hard to tell because the scenery barely changes between levels aside from the color palette, so the most obvious obvious difference is really just the game gradually getting harder. Well, game over! And this game is old enough that if you get game over, you're booted back to the very beginning of the game, but it seems a little harder now. Like, it may just be my imagination, but I swore the boss was much more aggressive on the second attempt. Does this game actually punish you for sucking by making you start over in hard mode? That's cruel! Also, if you have a buddy, you can plug in a second controller and do a two-player co-op game. Player 2 plays as Winby, though I can't imagine that two windshields on the side is very practical for seeing. Like, this seems like a pretty nasty design flaw. What's interesting, though, is that if you don't have a buddy to play with, you can still play in two-player mode by linking arms with the other ship. It even makes your shot more powerful. Just keep in mind that both ships need arms to do it, and if you use bombs, you'll unlink. Alright, let's move on to the next game. Burnin' Twin uh, Stinger. Yeah, this game was actually released in the US, but it had its name changed and also had its story cut out entirely. Oh, right, it's a disc system game. Here we go! Burnin' Twinbee! Thanks, DVD translations! Wow, that place is sending out satellite signals like crazy! No, oh, wait, I guess it's just being attacked. Oh no! They kidnapped the grandpa from Rugrats! Alright, let's go into more detail. This game takes place 100 years after the first game, where an alien snake thing known as Gatlantis has kidnapped Dr. Cinnamon, and it's up to his great-grandchildren, Squash, Whip, and Mellow to save him. 
Hang on a second. If this game takes place 100 years after the first game, then how the hell is Dr. Cinnamon still alive? That's the real question. Big trouble! The doctor's research laboratory was attacked by Gatlantis! They've kidnapped the doctor! Guys, we've gotta help him! Then let's hop in Twinby, Winby, and Gwinby and chase that saucer! This kind of reads awkwardly, and I'm not sure if it's the translation or the game itself, but considering the opening crawl from Castlevania 3 was just as awkward, I'm gonna assume that this was an 80s Konami thing. Also, I'd just like to point out that Mello looks like he really doesn't want to be here. It's like, WE HAVE TO SAVE THE DOCTOR! Ugh, do we have to? I just got the week off work. Besides, he's like 300 years old, he's probably just gonna keel over any day now. Now, the first thing you may notice when you start up the game is that we're now in a horizontal shmup instead of vertical. I guess Konami decided the game wasn't similar enough to Gradius, and opted to correct that mistake in the sequel. Aside from that, the game isn't too different since gravity still works normally and makes shooting the bells and getting power-ups much harder. Now you still have bombs, but there aren't any grounded enemies you need the bombs for. Instead, they're just used to destroy these cross-looking things to collect various items. Alright, now hold on a second. White Cross is located in a green field area, and I'm pretty sure that's a church we're looking at. Are we in a cemetery? Are we in a cemetery and did I just bomb a grave to steal its money? Are we grave robbing? How is this the only one that actually got released in the US. I don't think we're the good guys in this game. Also, what's with these weird bird heads? Anyone want to explain that? Occasionally, you'll come across these question marks that do random things when you grab them, like giving you invincibility, turning all the on-screen enemies into bells, and... Oh, that doesn't look good. So you may have noticed that I mentioned three characters instead of two. Yeah, as it turns out, thanks to the Famicom expansion port, this game actually allows for three players to play at once. This is really neat, especially for 1987. I don't really have a means of playing it with three players though, nor anyone to play it with, but I will admit that I got some amusement out of pushing the other ships around. I pushed them into each other and they started automatically firing this ginormous blast that just destroys everything. Look at this, I got game over a few minutes ago and I'm not even touching the controller right now, but the game's still going because of this. Sadly, the English version removed the three player option. It's not even possible with a multi-tap though, despite this, three ships are still displayed on the English box art for some reason. Now that's just false advertising. Alright, here's the first boss. It's a giant watermelon that fires seeds. I mean, I guess when you're a watermelon, what else are you gonna fire? Bullets? Nah, he's not packing heat. Not a lot else to say about this guy. You just shoot at it enough times and it anticlimactically explodes. No fanfare or anything, just boom, nice job, here's a bonus level. Alright, now for level 2, which as you can see is now suddenly back to being a vertical shooter like the first game. Make up your fucking minds, Konami, or at least make the vertical level first so players can experience something more familiar at the beginning. Generally speaking, it's the same as the first game. This level seems to take place underwater though, so at least there's more variety in the scenery this time. I'm not sure I like the idea of shooting a starfish though, so let's move on to the next game. Twin B3, the Aimless Demon King. Hang on, aimless? Come on, man, if you're gonna be a Demon King, you at least gotta have some drive. It's like the first thing you see in the Demon King handbook. Much like the first game, this one was only released in Japan, but rather than starting out as an arcade game, it was exclusively released on the Famicom, and to this day was only ever re-released once for mobile phones. And we're not talking smartphones either, no, this was in 2006. We're talking about a goddamn Nokia that you used as a phone and probably nothing else. Now this game is a lot more like the first one, a vertical shooter from beginning to end. This time, however, you actually have a choice of difficulty, with the option to play either easy peasy or hell. You can also allow yourself up to 10 lives, and you can choose between playing as Twinbee or Winby in a single player game, though the difference is merely cosmetic. Alright, let's get started. Hang on, what the hell was that? Is that a voice reading the name of the level? You may want to speak up, it's both way too quiet and compressed to properly make out. So the first thing I'd like to note is that the bells change color much faster in this game, making power-ups easier to grab. Also, if you lose your arms, the repair kit shows up every time like it should have from the beginning. One feature I absolutely love about this game is that if you die, your ghost lingers on the screen for a little while, and if you manage to grab it when you respawn, you get all of your power-ups back, making death a lot less frustrating. Really, everything about this game just feels better than the first two, and the stages themselves are more alive than ever as well. Alright, it's boss time, and just look at this guy. Shades, leather jacket, and even sticks his tongue out at you when he lands. Is this the aimless demon king? Sure looks like it doesn't give much of a shit about anything, so I can believe it. After a while, he starts to multiply, which can really drag this fight out, but if you got here with the spread shot, you should be fine. Alright, on to the next level. Wanana Bani st I'm sorry, what? Alright, looks like a river level. Aw, look at the cute little banana train. What? No! 
Man, Squash must hate Starfish or something. In the last game, you were shooting at him, and in this game, you're bombing them. Listen, man, I get that being attacked by saxophones and banana gators can really test your patience, but don't take it out on the Starfish. Aw, yeah, showtime. Let's listen to a cool, groovy tune from the band. Well, we killed the band. Squash is going to jail, isn't he? Overall, the Famicom Twimby games are a solid trilogy of shmups, but they're definitely showing their age in a few areas. They're worth checking out if you're curious, but not much to write home about, though Twimby 3 was a massive step up over the first two. It also had a great soundtrack. The first two games' soundtracks weren't bad, but Twimby 3 is just so catchy! I love just about every song in this game. Let's move on to the 16-bit generation, see what they have to show us. Alright, so next up is Detona Twinbee, released in 1991 for arcades, the TurboGrafx-16, and the Sharp X-68000. Starting with this game, the art was handled by Shujiro Hamakawa, also known as Shuzalo. He's an animator who worked on a shit ton of anime in his career. The idea was to put more focus on the pilots rather than just the ships and create a proper world beyond just shooting strawberries. Set several years after the first game, and many, many years before the second and third, this new generation of Twin Bee focuses on Dr. Cinnamon's grandchildren, including Light, the pilot of Twin Bee, Pastel, the pilot of Wind Bee, who's completely eclipsed every other character in popularity, and Mint, a baby who pilots Gwyn Bee but isn't always playable. Alright, let's get started. The first 16-bit entry in the series. Bells and God damn it! Yeah, this one was also released outside Japan, Europe specifically, and was given a different name. These days you can easily play this on the Switch or PS4 through Arcade Archives, so that's how I'll be looking at it. So in this game, Light and Pastel receive a distress signal from a woman named Princess Melora telling them that our home planet Mel, which the game mistakenly translates as Meru, is being invaded by a brain monster named Eva. Light and Pastel hop in their ships and head off to Mel to stop him, but I'm not entirely sure their priorities are straight. At one point they take a break at the beach and split a watermelon. Help! Our planet is being invaded! No, lunch first. So the first thing I want to say is that this game looks gorgeous. Backgrounds are detailed and very colorful, though admittedly a little too detailed as bullets are so small they kind of sometimes blend into the background making it hard to tell what hit me sometimes. Even without that though, this game is certainly no pushover. Especially in later levels, you're constantly being barraged by bullets from every direction. Absolutely an arcade game from the early 90s. Not impossible, but much harder than the first three games, even on easy mode, though admittedly I don't really care for reasons I'll get into in a sec. The gameplay is largely the same as its predecessors, though most of the improvements from Twin B3 have sadly been left out. You can't get your power-ups back when you die, and the bells don't change color nearly as frequently either. However, where some improvements were left behind, some new improvements take their place in the form of new power-ups and abilities. Grabbing the purple bell will give you the tail shield, which will destroy anything it comes into contact with, but it's not as useful as it sounds. Another power-up is Gwynby, who you can link up with and do what you could already do in multiplayer. This is really nice, allowing it in single player is really helpful, and if you're playing multiplayer, you can link up all three ships together for even more firepower. Also, if you're playing the European version, the shot and bombs are mapped to the same button, which should make taking out threats both airborne and grounded a lot easier, but when that isn't enough, it's time to break out the big guns. Holding down the shot button will charge up your shot into this enormous blast that'll eat up anything in its way. Look at how quickly I can take out the first boss. Yeah! Fuck you, giant enemy crab robot! The bosses this time around are more of the standard giant robot variety rather than the downright strange stuff we saw in the original Famicom trilogy, but they're also a lot more challenging. This guy in Stage 3 I find pretty annoying because you need to fire shots in just the right place so you can spin his head around until his weak point is facing you. This jellyfish guy in Stage 4 is constantly firing bullets and using this electrical attack, making hitting him without getting hit yourself a lot harder. And this snake isn't too hard, but be very careful to make sure it doesn't corner you. That said, all this difficulty doesn't really matter unless you're playing this in an actual arcade. The Arcade Archives port gives you infinite credit since you already spent $7.99 on it, and the game throws you right back in where you died if you got a game over. It even gives you some power-ups when you do so. This essentially means that no matter how much you suck at the game, you still beat it eventually. Kinda nullifies the feeling of difficulty for me. Like, I guess I hate the boss in Stage 6 because his spike balls are really fucking hard to dodge, or this mini-boss in the final stage that's constantly firing pretty wide shots making it hard to hit. But since I'm not at any risk, it doesn't really matter to me. Whether this could be considered a good thing or a bad thing really depends on the player. On one hand, I'm less likely to get a headache from how hard the game is, and if I really put my mind to it, it could be really good for practice. On the other hand, I'm sure that for many people, having nothing to lose could definitely feel like a hollow victory. I guess this could be considered more of a criticism of arcade games being ported to home consoles, but I guess you could also say that the arcade original was just rewarding the rich kid for being rich. 
Overall, Dead Dead Twin Bee is a pretty fun game though, so I recommend checking it out. If you want any actual riskier challenge though, I'd recommend maybe trying the console version since it has limited continues. Though if you're not a fan of using an emulator, you'll have to get a PC engine to play it. Dead Dead Twin Bee ended up proving very popular in Japan, resulting in Konami expanding the brand beyond the shmup series. Thus began a project known as Twin Bee Paradise, featuring a radio drama that ran from 1993 to 1997, a manga by Mina Yoshizaki of Sgt. Frog fame, and a four-episode OVA, none of which has ever been translated either officially or by fans. Maybe one day, but who knows? Hey guys, this video actually ended up running for a lot longer than I had expected it to, so it's going to be a two-parter, actually. I'm gonna have the second part out as soon as I possibly can, but for now, this is what we got. So, uh, until next time, everyone.